Okay, high level proteins and enzymes. These are the objectives. Um, so I'll be working through most of those. I've had a look through the last um, 10 years of paper threes and couldn't find a single question on using uh, the Beer Lambert law, uh, which is basically this and then um, this and that bit there. Uh, so we are going to skip that uh, because uh, it just doesn't come up in the tests um, and it's quite repetitive. Um, what comes up in the test, you'll basically get a one of these curves and ask to either draw and or explain and then you'll get some sort of interpretation of the buffer and perhaps using the buffer equation. Okay, so if you go to uh, my website, I've already set up uh, past exam questions for both of those. So you can, uh, I've got two videos that are just on the website that will answer or go through those two questions, but I'll also go explain it a lot in this PowerPoint. Um, and so here we have the isoelectric point. If you want to go back to the previous video on uh, standard level, um, what we have now is we're dealing with uh, these two situations in far more detail. So basically, uh, if the pH is greater or less than the pi, that determines whether you're going to be in this situation or in this situation. Uh, and the pK itself, if we go to a bit of revision, uh, so the Ka is this, so the pKa is the negative log of this, uh, and so if it's a strong acid, uh, this number is quite large, uh, which results in when you do a log, the number, the pKa is quite small. So just going back over this diagram again, this is uh, sometimes written as NH2 uh, and the COOH is still on this side. Um, so sometimes uh, that's sort of the same thing that the, they're just saying here that the hydrogen has popped off and gone over to here. So then that's become 3 and that's become minus. So if there is an excess of, uh, if it's acidic and there's an excess of H pluses, uh, you'll see that uh, it has gained in this particular case there's been a H plus gain on that end and if there's an excess of OH minuses that will take a H so in this particular case that one there's one here so it's gone to a 2 uh, and that one's popped off and joined up to here um, H plus is gone onto that side so following on this situation here, you can see that cation is, um, this is a cation because it has an overall positive charge because it's got the one extra H plus. And this one over here has lost uh, one, uh, and this one here has lost one H plus. So it's overall has a negative charge, which is displayed here. And so um, this situation here, uh, occurs when the pH is too high uh, and this, situ this, this situation here occurs when the pH is too low. So at pKa1 what you'll have here is uh, the zeturion gains a H plus and goes to the cation. So effectively this is acting as a base because it's accepting H pluses and if you go in reverse this is effectively going to be an acid because it's giving off the H pluses if it's in reverse. And in this particular case uh, over here when the pH is too high, you'll see that the zeturion has, ex has um, well, the anion here uh, is accepting a H+. Plus. So the anion here is the conjugate base. And this time the zeturion is the conjugate acid because in reverse it would be giving off uh, a H+. Plus. Uh, and so that's how you need to write it. Um, and so here you've got the OHs if it was with the base instead of with an acid. So the Henselson Hasselbach equation at uni, I, we, I think I just knew it was the buffer equation. People know I'm not good at names. Um, but uh, here it is. All right. So there we have the acid and the base, or conjugate base, um, and the log. Uh, good thing is you don't need to know that. That's in your data booklet. Yay. Uh, and that's just a reference to the best situation to try and uh, the pKa and the pH um, when they're equal then uh, that's when their buffer is working at its best. So uh, these are, these problems here are very good uh, test preparation. They're a little bit sort of maybe the test might just give you half of this, the, the first half or the second half, but it doesn't matter. Um, so the pH of an aqueous solution contains um, 
0.8 in the zwitteronic and 0.2 in the anionic. If it's in the anionic form, it must be OH minus. It must be higher than because it's taken off the H pluses. So it must be greater. So it must be the pKa2. All right. Uh, that's stated here, and I've written the equation there. Um, and so you just go to the uh, equation. So um, for this one here, so the zwitterion and the anion are present. And so what you have is that is the equivalent of the acid. Uh, and so that one goes here. Okay, you can see it here. Uh, and so that value up here is 0 0.8, and the other one's 0 0.2. So if you do the math on that, you should get pH of 8.5. That would probably be uh, a couple of questions on a test, so that might be part one and two or whatever. Uh, and some might be worth one, some might be worth two marks. All right, next one is problem two. Uh, this one is just a good question to understand. Uh, this would be quite a difficult question. Give us the pH of these two different situations, NaOH by itself and then a buffer situation. You've got the zwitterion here and the cation, so it must be, uh, that must be the pK that you're dealing with, and they're the values. Uh, so quite a complicated question. First, just basic standard level stuff. So if you've got uh, one gram of NaOH, you've got basically 0.025 OH molecules. Uh, so pH, uh, pOH is the negative log of the OH, so you get that value. And then pKW is these two put together, and the pH is these two to get together. So 14 minus the pO, um, the pOH will give you the pH. So we've got a pH increase of 5.4 if you just put uh, base in water and uh, so it goes up to 12.4 now we get back onto the standard level stuff so this is the equation because we're in an acidic situation and the pk is 2.3 uh, first of all what's going to happen we have the initial values given from the question of 0.4 and 1.6 and we know we're adding 0.025 that's going to the extra oh is going to react the cation and turn it into a zwitterion. Uh, and so we're going to reduce the cation by that volume and the OH all disappears and then that turns into a zwitterion. Uh, and so add those two together is um, 4.25, add those two together is zero, add those two together and the cation decreases down to 0.135. We grab all those values for the next slide uh, and so we have uh, those, values those new values substituted in to get the pH. And then we have the new situation, so that was the old situation. Uh, the new situation is here from the rice diagram, uh, and that's 2.8, so there's hardly any change at all. Um, and so if you add uh, this acid, uh, you'll go from this buffer concentration to this uh, buffer concentration, uh, and so there's hardly any change at all. So you can see how massive an effect a buffer has. All right, that one is a little bit too detailed. I'll probably get part of that in a question. So we're moving on. Uh, this one's an extension because it has algebra in it. So I'm just going to flip through that um, and leave that one as it is because I, I don't see them putting an algebra one in there, although they did in the past. So that's why it's there. I think they've simplified exams a little bit. All right, just going back to the theory. Uh, the old theory is lock and key, like the shapes fit exactly, but that doesn't actually make any sense because you're stuck in there, why would you pop out and change? So the induced fit method is much better. Um, so it wants to go in there, but to go in there it causes a little bit of stress. Uh, that causing of a little bit of stress will cause a bond to break and maybe come out as, as something else because a bond's broken in some other area. So basically the slight change in shape, this is worded here, weakens some of the bonds, lowering the activation energy of the transition state, allowing a chemical reaction to, to take place. Um, that makes a lot more sense. Um, in a chemistry point of view. Um, and so now we're getting more into what the sort of question they'll give you on the test. Um, so just know that the allosteric site is the place where the non-competitive inhibitor binds. That it permanently affects the active site and its ability to work. Uh, competitive inhibition is just something else comes in there and reacts. Uh, so the enzyme is still working well but it's not working well for you know the other thing that wants to come in there. So the affinity for the enzyme is decreased because it's, it's reacting with something else. And so um, this here is, is, is how it usually works, uh, why we have this, um, 
why we have these allosteric sites and um, inhibition. Uh, it's because uh, we don't want too much of something. It's a control mechanism, it's a negative feedback. So usually the products of the initial substrate cause the enzyme to slow down. So once we have enough of this, this actually also tells us directly, stops the enzyme from making more of it, uh, which is uh, how biology works. And only you understand, the biology students won't. There you go. Um, so the michaelis menten plot is what you'll see in every single biology paper, th uh, sorry, um, is what you'll see in every biochem paper three test. Uh, the important thing to know is these two values. So the Vmax is when it reaches its maximum. So it, it settles out here. So that's a nice place to get one of the constants. I often wonder why don't you take the initial rate of reaction? Well, it's a bit dodgy sometimes drawing tangent correctly. Um, so it's more, it's easier just to go halfway in between and get an average. So that's what they do. They take half of the maximum rate, draw a line across and use that as their value as a Km uh, value. And the Km, uh, importantly, if it's over on this side, it means it is reacting a lot faster. It's a steeper curve. If it's over on this side, uh, the Km, it means it's reacting a lot slower if you follow this line across. Uh, and so the affinity for the enzyme is greater on this side and it is uh, less on this side over here. And so uh, you need to know uh, how to interpret the, the Km for that. You also need to know how to interpret um, competitive and non-competitive inhibition. So if it is a competitive inhibitor, the enzyme's working fine. All you need to do is increase the concentration of the substrate to dilute out the interfering substance to get it to react um, at the rate here of, of a normal one. Basically, you're diluting the effect of the inhibitor by massively increasing the rate of, uh, sorry, the rate of cons uh, substrate. But if it is something that's binding to the side of the enzyme and it's permanently affecting its ability to act, then the, the Vmax will permanently be, dis, be, be sort of inhibited and will never reach the maximum amount. Uh, and so it will slow that way and it will also um, be underneath the initial curve, but it'll never reach the max uh, rate. Okay, uh, so that's important to be able to draw uh, the competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. Basically, just make sure that uh, the non-competitive does, uh, does, never reaches the top here and the competitive inhibitor does reach the top. Both are slower. Uh, probably would want to mention uh, in the answer too, it might be worth two marks, one's with the active site and one's with the allosteric site. Okay, so good to mention those two. All right, so here is a very typical question. Uh, so identify the type of inhibition. Uh, we just did that, uh, give these two values and outline the relationship between KM and enzyme activity. Very, very common questions. Um, so I uh, don't have a full answer here. So if you look at the previous, previous slide, it must be non-competitive um, because it doesn't ever, no matter how much you increase the computation, it doesn't get back to normal. Um, and so the Vmax, uh, in the absence of the inhibitor, you're gonna have to draw a line across here and hope for accuracy. Uh, and so I would go about 4.4 here and use the correct units. So be a bit lazy here, 4.4 of these. All right, uh, and the Km, so you take half of that, so you go 2.2 uh, and then draw a line across and then draw a line down and hope that I can draw a straight line. Uh, and so that's probably 1.6 with these units. Ooh, let's see if we outline the relationship with Km, Km and enzyme activity. Uh, Smaller Km increases uh, increases that. Okay, how did we go? So non-competitive, yes, 4.4, yeah, we got that right. Um, oh, there's a presence and non-presence of that. And, and absence and in the presence, oops, I only did half. Well, well, that's enough for you to see that. So half uh, is 4.4, got that right. And the Km 1.7, I didn't get right. So what did I do wrong there? Um, 4.4, uh, I got that right, so 2.2's here and then across there, so it should be 1.678, oops, yep. Okay, so make sure you read it carefully. 
And even then I didn't read it uh, good enough. I got an answer. I got an acceptable, but a 1.7. All right. Um, here. Uh, so read the question carefully, not like me, because I'm just re I'm going through these PowerPoints. Um, obviously too fast to read that test question. All right. And the higher the KM, lower the interactivity, lower the KM, higher always to that effect. Either of those, that's an easy point. Um, they don't usually ask. They ask, usually only ask this or this, and it's worth two marks. They don't usually ask for three. Um, so that's probably an older question. All right. Um, the next one, protein assays. As I said, I was quite shocked when I looked through all the papers not to find a single question on this. Um, so if they've thrown one in there, I'm sus that, that there is an examiner watching these videos. If you see one in a 2019 paper or later, they haven't done it in the last 10 years. Why are they doing it now? All right. Um, so protein assays determine the concentration of protein. So this absorbs. This just happens to be the place where the um, the proteins absorb that particular wavelength. So that's the the wavelength we use to see how much um, light is absorbed. Uh, we compare that to um, this equations in the data booklet. Um, we compare that to a set of a standard values and then we can draw that on a line so then we can take our unknown and when we see the absorbance of the unknown because we know what the absorbances are for different concentrations we can draw a line across and get our concentration. So that's the theory of it. Uh, apart from that I'm going to skip it because uh, you, sh you should have done Beer's Law in um, earlier sections uh, and this is just applying it to um, proteins uh, and there's uh, an equation to use as well if they ever decide to put that in a test. And that's it for proteins high level.